Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning or good evening, depending upon where in the world you happen to be seeing us today. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, the Open Mainframe Project Mini Summit. Um, hopefully, this gives you a great insight into open source and the mainframe, which uh, some of you might be coming in here and wondering, um, is this a joke? No. Um, and this is this is actually, you know, something that has been around um, for decades. And we really want to kick off today's um, session digging more into that. And then we're going to have some great presenters from our community. It's going to give you a little bit more insight to where the project's doing um, and what it's all about. So uh, to kick off, you know, let's, let's dig into this. What does the collaboration look like in the growth of open source enterprise computing, um, uh, you know, within this ecosystem? And and often the question that starts with is why even open source? Like why why is open source coming into this this ecosystem? And it's been really really interesting. Um, as you all know, we're in a pandemic right now, and it's been fascinating to see what open source has you know the, the flourishment of open source in this. And I'm sure you've heard from a number of different individuals. Um, I'm sure, you know, you've seen reports on the news, um, you know, of open source communities coming together, new projects being formed. Um, and I really found this quote from Martin Woodward um, at GitHub really fascinating um, of the taking of that collaborative model as it is shifted over to this broader um, open source, you know, ethos um, and how that same ethos is coming together as, as we really begin to move forward in, in um, our society here. And, you know, it's, it's really even shown with the amount of open source contributions that were happening. Um, and just in some of the, you know, foundations and projects that I've been involved with, you know, both with Open Mainframe Project and others, I mean, certainly there was a little bit of early disruption, but I think what's really been fascinating is the spirit of collaboration, the spirit of bringing everyone together as a society has just grown so strong um, you know, through this pandemic. And I think, I think that's one of the things that, that gives me a lot of hope, um, not only for society, but, um, and, I, and I'm really thrilled to see open source being at the forefront of that. What's really interesting is the Linux Foundation, um, this is really where our bread and butter is. And we see open source um, as one a collaboration piece, but the bigger, broader scope, if you, if you sort of take that 40,000 foot view, is it's an innovation engine. And everything we do here, the foundations and projects that we work with, this circle that you're seeing here is the thing that we look to drive. This is this is the model of when open source is killing it, how it's happening. We focus on that top segment there on projects, you know, making these projects successful, giving them the tools to succeed, giving them the structure to succeed, giving them the, the space to succeed. Um, and the relevancy of these projects over time, you know, falls into the downstream usage of this, either in commercial go-to-market products or internal uh, usage, um, you know, to provide uh, business critical applications. That success is judged by the amount of savings, the amount of um, funds earned, really the profits, you know, whether that's a savings mechanism from an R&D perspective um, or whether that's a new addressable markets perspective. And then that profit circles back into the project to continue that entire innovation cycle. This cycle, if it keeps going, um, this is what makes open source life blood happen. So we talked about open source in the mainframe. Um, you could actually, what's actually really interesting is open source actually started with the mainframe. Uh, if you go back to 1955, there was a, a event founded called Share. It still exists today. Um, they're doing their virtual event here uh, next month um, where mainframe operators, mainframe programmers got together in 1955, having this new technology and use this as a forum to share with one another, thus, thus the term share. Um, but they use that to share code. They use to share practices, um, you know, tips, how this was used. I mean, that's this, this, this was a lot of the purpose of that. Now, the medium was a lot different back then. They didn't have the internet to take advantage of, and um, they were using a lot of historical mediums in some cases. But the concept of having open collaboration between different organizations and people uh, that are 
all commonly bond by the same technology interest. It's huge, hugely interesting. Um, and so it all sort of started with there. Uh, we fast forward a couple decades to 1999. Uh, Linux itself, um, you know, by that point, about a decade old, um, is ported to the S390 architecture, which is um, the architectural term for mainframe um, as a community effort. And from there, things begin to flourish. Um, you know, major Linux distros get on board, uh, mainframe customers start getting on board, and that open source ecosystem, you know, quickly begins to hit that critical pat mass. But we see what happens when that critical mass starts to get hit um, is the challenges happen. And this is something we see across every single community we work with. Um, it all draws from a grassroots effort, which is really the fantastic part about open source. It's very much a scratch your own itch model. But um, oftentimes we see communities sort of hit a little bit of a glass ceiling. Um, you know, the, the, there's independent, you know, everyone's sort of driving different independent efforts. You don't see sort of that shared hub where it's coming together. Um, the events are move away from a community focus and they become very industry vendor focused. Um, as that next generation is looking to engage, they really have trouble navigating the space. Um, and, you know, furthermore, and I think this is um, specific to an architectural community, you see different organizations that are taking on the solo efforts of working upstream where they could be using this community together to have a much more meaningful impact. So the real takeaway was open source was really, it wasn't doing bad, but it really was hitting a glass ceiling of where it goes next. So in 2015, the Open Mainframe Project was founded with the, the concept of build, bringing together the open source ecosystem on mainframe. One of the big first focuses was bringing together, it was helping bring that next generation in there. And in the next year uh, they brought in uh, we had eight interns that started working on open source specific to mainframe, porting Alpine Linux to the platform as one example, making contributions to Hyperledger, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, OpenStack, and many others. And then from there, our next big uh, step forward here was the launch of broad open source projects. And, and really the ones that we're the most excited about and you'll learn about today is Zoe, which is a project that brings together the ZOS world back with the modern DevOps and developer technologies that are prevalent today within organizations. And uh, it's the largest and first really ever open source project on the ZOS platform, which is really an exciting milestone. And as the community really saw this as a rallying cry, all of a sudden the innovation begins to accelerate. Uh, last year we launched five new projects this year, um, we have two logos. We've actually lost, launched three new projects, and that's just continuing on and on and on. And we're just seeing that natural growth begin to happen. And what I really find fascinating here is it really cements this as mainframe is a key part of open source success. Um, right here, 90% of mainframe customers are using Linux on their mainframe. Um, and probably even if you bring in some of the ZOS open source usage, that probably comes higher. It's prevalent. Open source is all over the mainframe. So really where the role of this foundation and foundations come in here is really to enable those gears of innovation to spin faster. And if we look at those three points that we looked at, they're really gears that are all working together. There's none that work independently. Each one has a, a dependency on one another. Um, and so this is really, we're going to dig in from here and, and, and I'm really excited to, uh, invite in here next, our next speech, speaker, Stacy Miller. Uh, she's one of our marketing co-chairs of our mainframe project marketing, um, committee. She's from SUSE, um, which was a great platinum sponsor of this, uh, event and also uh, a platinum member of the open mainframe project. And she's going to give you a little bit more on just an overview of the open mainframe project itself. So Stacy, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. I am Stacy Miller, and I'm one of the marketing co-chairs at the OMP, and I am a product marketing manager at SUSE. So I'm really thrilled to be here. So let's dig in a little bit. So this picture is what most people think of when they think about the mainframe. You know, it's kind of grayscale, takes up a whole room. Um, it's on a raised floor. 
And, you know, it's, it's big and bulky. And why would I want to worry about it today? What's, what's it got, what's, what's it going to do for me? And yes, that is what the mainframe looked like in the 1950s. But let's fast forward to today. And it's kind of like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. And here we have the modern mainframe. And like the big mainframe of old, the modern mainframe provides such things like resiliency and security, availability and performance and scalability. It's all the things that you look for in a modern platform. Plus, it's the only platform that can do such things like hot swapping for business continuity. And like John said, it runs Linux and open source. So you might be wondering, well, that's all great, fine, good, mainframes are good, but what does the mainframe do for me? How does the mainframe impact me in my life? Well, the mainframe is hugely impactful. If you do any kind of banking, bankings run on data. They have fast tra a lot of transaction, a lot of transactional data. If you bank, your bank is really running, a probably running a mainframe in the background. Insurance companies are running, you know, they rely on data for policy options and, and accidents and um, uh, predictions of, of high risk areas. They are probably running mainframes in the background. Any kind of healthcare, some of the research that they're doing with COVID and the, the vaccines and the um, prophylactics, those those um, that industry is relying on mainframes and any of the government or transportation, those industries are also reliant on high volumes of data and that data can only be stored on the mainframe. And then retail, think of the transactional amount of, of um, transactions on the, on, in the retail industry. Those retail um, stores are relying on the mainframe as their backbone. <clears throat> so the mainframe is really a critical component. It's a cornerstone of our society. If mainframes went away, all of these industries would have true, true issues. And payroll, let's talk about payroll. This is a great example of the mainframe. ADP is one of the largest payroll processing companies in the world. And not surprisingly, they are running a mainframe. They pay one in six US workers and one in four Canadian workers. And they're running more than 8,000 VMs on Linux on the mainframe. So if you like getting paid, because I know I like getting paid, thank a mainframer. So the, bo the bottom line here is really that mainframes are here today and will be tomorrow. In a recent OMP survey, some key priorities of IT were security, performance, scalability. Not surprising, right? It's also not surprising that that is exactly where the mainframe strains the line. So like John said, the OMP is really part of the Linux Foundation. And the Linux Foundation has been in place for 20 years. But the OMP has been in place for the last five years. And really our goal is to focus on open source projects that are broadly applicable to society and the advancement of the mainframe. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is our mission statement. And our mission statement is really to build a community around the adoption of open source on the mainframe, like I just said, with three tenets, eliminating barriers to open source adoption, demonstrating value and strengthening, strengthening collaboration. Some of the ways that we do that are we engage as central experts in demonstrating the mainframe as a viable open source platform. We promote modern applications and workload examples. We showcase technical and business case studies through blogs and white papers and other media. We'll help to champion software and business 
and hardware solutions with clients. And we like to, to provide career opportunities from internships through retirement because we don't want the developers of today to forget that the mainframe is a viable option for their next employment. So I'm gonna skip these next few charts because we just talked about those. And we're gonna talk about some of the open mainframe project momentum that we've had going. So in the past five years, we've had 30, we have 36 organizations that support us. And I'm proud to say that SUSE is one of them. We have had more than 200 project contributors. We've hosted 12 projects. We've sponsored 40 plus mentees, but most importantly, we've impacted more than 100 students. And let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about how the open mainframe project is driving momentum. You can see that pre August 2018, we had a couple of projects, but we really launched our, we really had our big momentum push in August of 2018 when Zoe was launched. And Zoe is perhaps our most famous project. But I'm really excited about some of the new projects that we launched this year, including the COBOL training project. Now we'll talk about it a little bit and we'll have a whole section on that later on in this mini summit. Now let's talk a little bit about the mentorship program. Like I said, it's really important to the open mainframe project that we, we educate the developers of tomorrow. And during their summer, summer mentorship program, the OMP has worked with 18 academic institutions and has impacted more than 100 students and 40 mentees. And one of the mentorship projects that's near and dear to my heart is one that started in 2018 with SUSE. That project proved that all the components and packages for a containerized cloud foundry solution could be built and successfully deployed on Linux on Z. That project continued in 2019, and it built upon the 2018 success and focused on automating the building of components and packages. That project was also a success. That, this multi-year mentorship program will culminate this year, and the goal of this year's effort will focus on making contributions to the upstream project. So an S390X build is always a first-class citizen in the Cloud Foundry community. I'm gonna skip this slide because we already talked about that. But I wanna talk a little bit about the COBOL program. So this project was launched earlier this year in in direct response to COVID-19. Um, it was found with the, the, um, the, the, the pressures of COVID-19 and the, the, the people that were out of work that governments were facing this very difficult technical challenge they needed to process unemployment claims and they were facing with, faced with unprecedented circumstances and volumes of unemployed filings. What they found were they didn't have the programmers, the COBOL programmers to, to help um, update their system so they can process those claims fast enough. So the OMP launched this initiative, this incubation project um, around COBOL on GitHub. And this project was incredibly successful with more than 1400 stars on GitHub and 1600 individual volunteers.
So part of the Open Mainframe Project mission is also to build an inclusive community through investment in programs. We want to make sure that the underrepresented and disadvantaged groups in the world are represented in the OMP and more broadly in the mainframe community. And there has been a lack of representation in women in technology, which is especially notable in the mainframe community. So we partnered with SHARE on the launch of the Women in IT Initiative. We ran events at the Phoenix, Pittsburgh, and Dallas conferences, and they've been wildly successful, you know, with upwards of over 200 participants. The bottom line is that the OMP is committed to continue the support for women in technology. And in 2020, we'll have a maniacal focus to ensure that the OMP committee and projects are diverse and represented by all groups. So just to kind of close it out, to round it out here, the Open Mainframe Project is all about innovation. It provides a vendor neutral home for mainframe centric open source projects. You know, in partnership with the Linux Foundation, we can support project communities, we can establish guidelines and best practices and enable diverse communities to grow and adopt open source on the mainframe. And we really want to promote that natural collaboration between main, the mainframe and open source projects. And I'm sort of going to leave it with this, that supporting a strong open source ecosystem on the mainframe is crucial to sustainability. The Open Mainframe Project is intended to serve as a focal point for deployment and use of Linux and open source in a mainframe computing environment. And I invite you to follow us and visit us and learn more about the Open Mainframe Project at l.openmainframeproject.org. So now I'm going to turn it over to Sadarshna. I told her I was going to butcher her name to talk more about our COBOL initial initiative. That was very, that's being very successful. And we like. Thank you, Stacy. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sudarshna Srinivasan. I'm a program manager at IBM for the ecosystem team, the Z ecosystem team, which has a multifold uh, mission on uh, the one end to outreach and engage developers through the academic initiative to reach out to students and also work with clients to help them build their skills pipeline. Um, and for all of the work that we've now done recently around the COBOL program that Stacy already touched upon, um, I was also recently conferred the title of COBOL queen. As Yvette pointed out, I forgot my crown, but um, let's just talk about you know, what the COBOL project, COBOL course project was all about. Um, it was a really um, e exciting project to be part of, right? Um, creating a public domain COBOL course that would land on the open mainframe project. So it was, it was a real fun project to be part of and be part of the solution. So being part of a solution obviously brings up the question of um, what is the problem, the inherent problem that we were trying to solve, one of skills shortage. And as you can see here, you know, you do a quick Google search on skill shortage in any industry. It, there, is, there is always skills gap and um, manufacturing and cybersecurity, for instance, we've heard a lot about. So my point being, um, Skill shortage is not unique or um, to the mainframe space. But what did happen was with the coronavirus pandemic and the unprecedented number of unemployment claims being filed in the month of April, we all saw how COBOL made news. Um, so let's just back up in time a little bit and uh, take you through a journey of how this COBOL course came to being, right? Back in fall of 2019, 
um, IBM in collaboration with some of our clients and American River College here in Sacramento, California, worked on bringing some of our best SMEs, COBOL experts together and put together a team of these SMEs to work on a residency to start building this COBOL course. So all of this came to fruition in February of this year. Our team was working in Sacramento on a face-to-face -face residency early in March, and then came the uh, lockdowns and all of the coronavirus um, uh, shutdown that happened. So the teams went back to working virtually and all of the content was ready to go. And here we are ready to launch the course on open mainframe project. Thanks to the amazing team um, with John leading um, uh, and being our point person uh, from open mainframe project. And as you know, COBOL made news in April. It was probably one of the most exciting projects I've been on where there was so much um, excitement around COBOL and uh, folks were really looking for this content even before it could land. And so the course was um, launched on April 14th on Open Mainframe Project. What was unique about this COBOL course right from the get-go was to bring in this modern tooling, something that our young developers, our next generation developers are already used to, um, the interface, right? So we went with VS Code, with Zoe, of course, um, another open mainframe project, with Zoe as the interface to the mainframe, and IBM Z Open Editor, which comes with um, syntax highlighting and other really cool features, which would help a developer write and edit COBOL code. So the course itself as content was built into two parts. Part one, addressing all of this tooling and the access aspects, and part two, really diving into the COBOL language, the basics of COBOL. Keep in mind, the goal of this project was to build an introductory, a, a beginner level course for our first time learners. This one is interesting and Stacy pointed out, um, you know, this is not the mainframe of the 1950s and uh, showed us an image of the brand new Z15 that launched last fall, September 2019. Um, I like to point your attention to the top right corner of this slide. One of our team members um, works was working from Hersley. He couldn't be there in Sacramento for the face-to-face -face, um, and the pandemic anyway. Um, with the lockdowns, he could not travel. But here is a picture of him connected to the mainframe using this modern interface tooling of VS Code, Zoe, and ZOpen Editor. And on his car drive, I think he said he was driving to go drop his wife at the airport. And on his drive, he was able to work on a chapter of the book. He was actually the author of the branching logic chapter of the book and building the labs for it all while he was on the drive. So that is the, the modern interface and the modern mainframe for you, right? This is a really uh, powerful chart. So I, I, I had to take it from Will and his deck. So we talked about the COBOL course and how this was in collaboration with clients, with the university, and um, with Open Mainframe Project being our launch landing pad. Once again, the team with Op at Open Mainframe Project were uh, amazing to work with and landed so smoothly amid what I would like to call the COBOL frenzy. So we um, made it publicly available with the GitHub repository and everything ready to go and up on April 14th. And on April 17th, this was one issue that came up. One that was not about uh, an, a problem with the lab access or a question about the course itself, but one that as the text says, um, Uh, 
um, sorry about the connection there, that he was able to um, write his first COBOL program. What we also have done is put together a COBOL I'm really sorry with uh, the internet connection here on my end. Can you still? I hope this is going to be stable here. Um, I was saying we also then stood up a, a COBOL resource hub on IBM developer. The resource hub points to the GitHub re repository of the course on open mainframe project. Um, multiple videos, blogs around COBOL, code patterns, tutorials, a lot of content that folks who are eager to learn about COBOL can find content here. What we also did is pull together a series of webinars called COBOL Fridays. And I've been hosting that weekly on Fridays for the past 10 weeks now. Um, the goal there was really to take the chapters of the COBOL course bring in subject matter experts from across industries, from different companies, and come and talk to us about the specific chapter, uh, uh, be it branching logic or intrinsic functions, or just about file handling and how does COBOL handle that. And I'll tell you, it has been a huge success. And we're glad we were able to engage with our learners in a, in a periodic weekly cadence. So there was the COBOL call, and you've heard all about our response. So I'd just like to take a moment here and just highlight some of the, the real success in terms of you know, numbers and what we've accomplished here as a team. The GitHub repository has over well over 100,000 views. Um, one that I would like to highlight is we have over 315 repository forks as of today. One special uh, highlight here is the Zoe Explorer, we have over 10,000 downloads to Zoe Explorer. And if you remember, COBOL, this COBOL course leverages the Zoe interface to access the mainframe. Um, so we're really excited that we were able to bring in a sister project of Open Mainframe Project into this. And um, so the COBOL journey continues, right? We now have a technical steering committee in place with members from the Linux Foundation, Broadcom, and IBM. I would like to really thank all of them for their continued support and uh, eager engagement in this uh, COBOL programming course repository and uh, the GitHub process here. Mike, Jelly, Zabura, Martin, Paul, our very own John Murtick, um, they have really groomed this in the past couple of months to where we are today. The COBOL course is now split into three um, format, three spe uh, specific courses. Course one addresses the beginner level class that we just um, launched in April. Course two is open for our community to bring in those advanced topics, you know, interaction of COBOL with Kicks, IMS, DB2, um, what have you. And then course three is um, the space where you can bring in lab materials and um, test projects that you could then use to run COBOL applications on ZOS. So the TSC meets um, monthly on the second Tuesday of every month. The information about these calls are on our COBOL programming course calendar. I welcome the community to come and uh, join us and be part of this journey. So thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to um, the exciting excitement around COBOL and the specific COBOL pro, uh, uh, course on Open Mainframe Project. I'd like to hand it over to Sujay to talk about Zoe. All right, thank you so much, Sudarshana. Uh, really cool uh, to see what you guys have done with the COBOL project and you know integrating Zoe into it as well. So I'll go into a little bit of detail with Zoe itself. Um, so my name is Sujay Solomon. Uh, I work for Broadcom as a DevOps advocate. Uh, 
on the Zoe side. I'm on the Zoe Leadership Committee, um, and I'm also part of the onboarding squad, which helps uh, you know either new users as well as new vendors who are looking to integrate with Zoe. So uh, those are, that's what I am part of. So we'll start with uh, you know, what is Zoe at its core. Uh, I'm not going to be going over the basics too much because I think we've talked about Zoe uh, at OSS in the past. Uh, but we have actually uh, iterated on our on our release cadence, and we've launched something called LTS, which is a long-term support uh, version of Zoe. So I'll be going into some detail there. Uh, and then along with that, we've also upgraded our conformance program, which involves third-party vendors building extensions to Zoe and uh, how we're tackling conformance for those extensions. And I'll give a little bit of a preview on sort of where we're taking Zoe in the future. So what is Zoe? Um, Zoe is an open source project uh, under the Open Mainframe project. Uh, and most of our code happens to be in uh, EPL, Eclipse Public License 2.0. Uh, 1.0 version of Zoe was launched in February of 2019. And the contributions came from Broadcom, IBM, and Rocket Software at the time. And what Zoe at its core is, is an integrated as well as extensible ecosystem for ZOS with a set of user as well as programmatic interfaces. So it's not restricted to just user interfaces. Uh, we also are aiming to provide programmatic interfaces with the intent being just generally increasing the accessibility of the services on ZOS. So what Sudarshana was showing was sort of an example of that, right? Where uh, you know there's folks who want to develop COBOL, uh, but you know being able to access that through interfaces such as VS Code really increases the accessibility of the platform. So that's what our focus is within Zoe. The major components of Zoe, and I'll start from the bottom here. So part of what we do is we want to offer REST APIs for uh, traditional services that are running on ZOS. So you know you might be accessing jobs, you might be accessing data sets, or there might be third-party products, uh, you know, uh, from various vendors that you might be accessing. And we provide enablement tooling that allows those products to build REST APIs. And when you've got a lot of those REST APIs, you need a way of managing those APIs on ZOS itself, on the mainframe. And that's where the second layer comes in, the API mediation layer. So the API mediation layer uh, centralizes access to these APIs. Uh, it offers uh, just very recently things like single sign-on capabilities, uh, where all of the APIs that are being accessed can share the same security context and token regardless of the client that they're accessing it from. So we're really building that ecosystem where it's not just one vendor, it's not just uh, you know IBM itself, it's, it's anybody who is building uh, APIs and products on the mainframe, they're able to uh, funnel all of those APIs through a single mediation layer. And then of course, there's a lot of clients. I mean, we need uh, interfaces through which your general users can actually call into these services. And that's where these three interfaces come in. So um, so Darshan, I talked about Zoe Explorer. Uh, that's a Visual Studio Code extension. The same extension actually also works in some of the newer, uh, you know, hosted IDE platforms such as Eclipse Shea. Uh, so the squad that's focused on uh, the VS Code extension also makes sure that the same extension works in technologies like Eclipse Shea. The second interface is a command line interface. So this is something that you can install on your PC, Mac, whatever it is, and you can re, uh, you know you can create automation using a CLI. So the typical use that you would have for a CLI, which is scripting up you know automated tests or process automation from uh, continuous integration and delivery tools like Jenkins and so on. And finally, uh, we've got a Zoe desktop interface, which you can access through a browser. Uh, and on a browser, you know, you don't have to go into 3270. Uh, all the services that you typically would need to go into TSO ISPF for, you're able to go in there and you can graphically, you know, you move your mouse around on the browser and, and it'll pretty much act like it's a virtual desktop for the mainframe. Very useful for a lot of the system administrators and IT folks who work with the platform. So that was a very fast introduction to Zoe. Now, as we're maturing, 
there's an expectation from our user base that we need to indicate which releases of Zoe they can actually trust in and that, that we will provide long-term support for it. So what we've done is we've taken a leaf out of Node.js and we've used their model when it comes to our uh, release cadence and maturity of a release. So we follow this model where there's a current phase of our release, uh, an active LTS phase when you can expect to receive both bug fixes as well as uh, some non-breaking enhancements. And then we'll go into a maintenance long-term support phase, uh, which uh, is going to only get maintenance and no new features. And we'll just rinse and repeat that process. So. These processes are quite common, and, and the thing is, with, with, the, with the beginning of each year, we will let our community know if we have the intent of releasing a new version in that year or not, so that folks can actually plan on performing upgrades as needed. Uh, we don't guarantee that every year there will be a new LTS release, uh, but we will let you know in the beginning of the calendar year if we intend to release it or not. Now, the combination of active and maintenance LTS is designated on, as the LTS or long-term support release. And what you can expect from this is that critical defects will be fixed in these releases. And the criteria for what a, a critical defect is uh, described on zoe.org. And another critical thing is that extenders who are integrating with Zoe you are now able to build conformance for this LTS support version and you will not need to modify it uh, in order to remain functional when you know the Zoe community provides distributions within that boundary. So it really allows our extenders to look at an LTS release and say, hey, if I can actually uh, integrate with this LTS release, then I'm kind of set for a while. I might need to do a little bit here and there, uh, but I know that I'm conformant with a release that's marked as long-term support by Zoe. And at a minimum, each LTS uh, phase, uh, sorry, active and maintenance LTS phase together uh, will run for at least 24 months. And you know, our advice would be production applications should be running this LTS release of Zoe uh, and not uh, any of the, uh, the lesser ones such as uh, the, uh, the earlier phases. If you want more information on our LTS program uh, and release cadence, uh, please go to zoe.org. And if you scroll down, you'll see a section there called Release Timeline. Expand that out, and you'll get a lot more information on our LTS cadence and release there. Now, in support of the LTS release, we have a conformance program, which, uh, you know, it's it's for third-party plugins, extensions, uh, and it's an optional program. You know, you can extend Zoe without getting conformance, but getting conformance gives your users the confidence that they're using an extension that has gone through proper conventions, quality gates, and it's earned that stamp of approval from OMP. Uh, the badge has been revised a bit. We used to have these badges uh, kind of mapped to a year, which was 2019. We've discontinued that. Uh, now we've launched a version one of conformance. So we are no longer going to align with years, but we're going to rather align with releases of Zoe. The test criteria has been revised to reflect these changes. And uh, if you go to zoe.org and you know, look at the LTS release as well as the conformance program, you'll be able to find all these details there on what has changed with the conformance program. Now, the process. Uh, if you are a vendor and you would like to build extensions that are conformant, uh, you're able to go to this website, openmainframeproject.org, project Zoe conformance, and the steps are quite simple. Uh, you can review the program. Uh, you actually perform some tests on your own. You submit your request, and your request is reviewed by Open Mainframe Project staff. So none of us folks from you know the vendor organizations get involved in the evaluation of conformance. So you know if you need uh, you know to keep the information just with OMP, that is absolutely possible. It will be kept confidential, and uh, you know, us vendors may not need to get involved at all. 
And just a quote here I'd like to share is this is one of the folks that integrated with Zoe uh, you know, after the initial launch. Uh, this is a quote from Ed Jaffe from Phoenix Software. He's their CTO. And he said, you know, we've observed throughout our 40 years in business that almost every decade or so there is some transformative technology that comes along and it really enhances the usability, the user experience of the platform. And to them, they say that they believe Zoe is this decade's transformative technology and it would be a mistake not to embrace it. So pretty strong, um, confident quote there from Ed. And where we're taking Zoe, you know, I mentioned those three layers. Uh, where we're going is we're introducing on top of the APIs a set of SDKs that are focused on Node.js and Python right now. Uh, we expect folks to use these SDKs as language libraries directly if they're building apps and they want to interface with uh, services on ZOS. Uh, we've also got another incubation project in Zoe called the Zoe Mobile App. Uh, and all of these, uh, we aim to actually use the SDK as an underlying component as well, rather than talking to the REST APIs directly. And with that, uh, you know, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, please visit zoe.org. Uh, we also have Slack channels. You can get started under the Open Mainframe Project website. Uh, if you want to extend Zoe, uh, you can review the extenders guide. Uh, there's samples there, and if you'd like to contribute, uh, please come to our, our, our GitHub repo, which is github.com slash Zoe. And uh, keep in mind, we're not just building technology. We absolutely are building a community here around opening up the mainframe uh, to the rest of the world. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex Kim for the next section. All right. Thank you, Jay. That was a very nice overview, and I appreciate the, uh, all, the, all the work that you did for Zoe. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Kim from Vicom Infinity. Uh, today, I wanted to show a, a use case about uh, Zoe that Sujay just went over. Um, so it might be some live demo involved. I don't know how it's going to work, but uh, we'll try. <laughs> so um, Zoe is a platform to connect users and developers to mainframe uh, ZOS operating system. And I was trying to understand what other fun, you know, uh, project that we can try to use and prove it how Zoe can be used. And then at the same time, we had a, a some you know side project in our company called Viva, which is a uh, it's a voice assistant. Uh, I guess some of you may already have Alexa or Google Home in your home. I saw some research that. It, uh, 25% of grown-ups over 18 in U.S. have uh, some type of voice assistant at their home. It's a large number and growing population and demands. And we were trying to create, a, you know, like a solution for enterprise users that securely help with the voice user interface. And we thought about using it for, you know, mainframe. Basically, you can ask questions about your mainframe statistics and then get answered by voice securely encrypted, uh, of course, in the, in the transmission and everything. And Zoe uh, was perfect platform to try because it had the various API endpoints. And then we actually work with uh, Zoe members to kind of use uh, one example API in the early days of Zoe uh, introduction, um, which is, um, you know, this is basically how you know our platform interact with Zoe. Is basically I have I, I guess you can see in my back here. This is Aviva, and we can talk to the mainframe in our company through Zoe API interface, and then we can connect to the uh, IBM Watson platform where it act as a natural language processor, and then you know calls back to uh, NLP API services. Uh, that hosted on a mainframe and then get the answers and speaks back to us uh, our smart speaker uh, viva and these next uh, I will show you so this is the one of the APIs uh, that we used I don't know if you can see clearly but you can see the restful API definition as CPU flash breakdown and the API catalog from Zoe uh, desktop 
is showing what other API services you can actually use for your mainframe. You can add more as you add more API services with API mediation layer. And this, you can see here uh, that when we ask for CPU uh, snapshots, you can see some detailed JSON response. And that's how we actually feed back to our voice assistant and make it speak back to you. So a quick example, I, I'll try to demo it. I don't know if you can see it and hear it clearly, but I'll try anyway. Hey, TJ, what is the current CPU utilization? The current CPU utilization as CPU is 2%. So basically, I asked for CPU utilization, and it goes back to our mainframe, Zoe API mediation layer, and gets this information, uh, like in the previous chart, and then send back the information to our API service routine, and then speak back through the Watson. Uh, one other way, well, you can think of using Zoe API uh, services through Slack. I know some of the uh, Zoe developers and, and users try to integrate Zoe APIs into Slack. I'm just going to try to show you the same API I just demonstrated through a Slack channel. Uh, just love to try different technologies uh, from this platform. So this is the Slack bot that I am using with Watson. And then it goes back to Zoe API routine that I shared. Uh, when I say, you know, what is the current CPU utilization? Same question I asked to uh, voice assistant. It goes back to Zoe API routine, and then it returns the value, and then it get it can get you the uh, answer right here. The current CPU utilization is one percent. Our, our machine is really low utilized because we don't really run any production. So this is another example. You can basically use all these APIs in many different ways. You know, a lot of enterprise users, they have their own uh, API services routine, and they have uh, monitoring tools, operational tools. But this was something that I, I thought maybe is fun to show and demonstrate uh, to a lot of you know, newcomers on the mainframe. And it's actually really fun to work with, because I started working on this project with an intern, and luckily, <laughs> I was able to have another intern for this summer uh, that I'm working on. Uh, we are doing some fun projects started in uh, May, and you can see his name is Lisa Lee from Nigeria. Uh, he's actually a medical student, and <laughs> he's a software programmer, and he's very good because uh, we wanted to create another API for Zoe that we can read uh, our map reports. Uh, our map stands for resource monitoring facility. Like any other servers, there are tons of system information generated by you know, uh, ZOS operating system. And we like to away another you know, open source programs can int integrate those data and also consume those data in JSON format. So we started a project called uh, Zebra. It's not our own name yet, so it's not really published name. But um, we wanted to convert our map report into JSON so that we can feed into uh, databases like MongoDB or Kafka and also feed into graphical tools like Grafana. So the so list has been working very hard. And we want to demonstrate it can be actually used in many other you know, users uh, with other open source programs. So he's been doing uh, great work. And this is the sample uh, sna snapshot of his work. You can see that uh, on the left side, there is a CPU report. And the right side, there is a workload report. It's been generated by his project work. And then you can see that it's actually printed out as a uh, JSON format. So it will be great to bring him on board when we get a chance to present over Open Mainframe Project Summit and then show you what Open Mainframe Project is actually doing great for students 
and open source community. So uh, this was a quick demo and overview of uh, Viva use case, uh, Zoe use case, Viva. Um, I will, I'll hand it over to our next presenter, Yvette Lama from IBM. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you so much, Alex. Great overview. And thanks for everybody else for, for going through some neat projects that are involved with um, the Open Mainframe project. Uh, I am Yvette Lamar, and I am the director of the IBM Z Influencer Ecosystem, and also co-chair of the marketing committee with Stacy on the Open Mainframe project. And so what I'm going to do is take you through how to get involved with the Open Mainframe project. So. As you've heard before um, and early in the sessions, the Open Mainframe Project um, provides sustained mainframe support in the broad open source community and is a neutral home for project. It increases the willingness of developers from other companies and independent developers to collaborate, contribute, and also become committers. The LMP provides a unique set of services for the mainframe community that includes infrastructure, access to SMEs for developer support, marketing assistance, as well as governance. I mean, access to Linux on Z, ZOS. It's just an amazing program to provide developer support in the mainframe platform. So how do we get started? First of all, it's open to all who are interested in mainframes and open source. And let me show you how we can, how we can go through it. First off, you can check out the OMP communities and supported events, and I'll dive into this a little bit next. Um, you can also participate in a project. Per the previous slides, you know, right now we actually have 12 shared R&D open source projects. You can participate in one of those, or you can bring your own project to be considered and hosted by OMP. For example, I'm involved with the open mainframe education process that were just being developed. COBOL was something that was brought in. Zoe was something that's brought in. So. You, you have the opportunity to bring a, a project for review with what's called the Technical Advisory Council. And you can actually be involved with the TAC, as it's called, and they direct and coordinate activities and investments made in the technical community and provide a home and infrastructure to open source projects supporting the mainframe. So anyone can contribute, become a project committer or maintainer and have the potential to serve on the TAC based on the success and quality of their contributions as, as they're recognized by their peers. We also encourage companies to become sponsoring participants and support the mission of the op Open Mainframe Project. And there's seven, several different levels for corporate participation. So those are sort of the three main ways you can get involved. And what I'd like to do now is kind of dive into ways to participate for yourself and for your companies um, through communities, forums, and events. So just right off the bat, let me move this over here. Let's talk with, I am a mainframer. This is a, a podcast series which explores the careers of those in the mainframe ecosystem. The interview series highlights those that are new to the mainframe as well as the more tenured mainframers. Now each episode is a conversation that highlights the technical marvels of the mainframe today, gives insights into the mainframe industry, and provides advice for those looking to learn more about the technology. It's broadcast monthly, and you can check out the, the, uh, the link here is in the charts, you can check out earlier podcasts on the site, and there's great talks with amazing guests like Sebastian Wind, who was the 2017 Master of the Mainframe global winner. He's also an IBM champion. He just happens to have a mainframe in his basement at his house. So amazing podcast with Sebastian. And also even Liz Joseph, she is an author. She's one of our open source speakers and a Linux on Z developer advocate extraordinaire. So please check this out because there's great stories every single month um, and great interviews on the I am a mainframer. Then we also have the whole meetup group that's available for, um, for the open source community. You know, right now, a lot of stuff we're doing is digital, but the, the meetup group is becoming vibrant. And as we, the doors open up around the world, we'll be able to do more meetups face to face, but we have a vibrant digital community. And then as it has been mentioned in earlier presentations, we have a great Slack channel. And the other thing that's really amazing that was mentioned by Siddharshana and Stacy is our community forums. And you know, as was mentioned in some of the other presentations, it was so important 
when we launched our COBOL course. You know, the timing of the COBOL course coming out and unfor the unfortunate pandemic with COVID, you know, there, there was that intersection that the open mainframe project was able to put, you know, calls out to their community, help us. Do you have community, do you have COBOL skills? And it was just amazing. As, as both Sadarshan and Stacy said, we had so many responses and those, those people responding were students you know, early professionals, seasoned professionals, retirees. It was across the board. And I think Stacey mentioned 1,600 individuals. I think it's up to 1,700 people have offered their services. But about 1,400 of those came in in a course of about three to four to five days. So it's just amazing the, um, the vibrancy and the attention that the community has around um, about mainframes. And... So to keep involved, it's really nice you are able to add these meetings and add these events to your calendar so you don't miss anything. Uh, all you need to do is, is subscribe to, the, to our calendars and we will feed you information about meetings that are coming up, events that are coming up, and they'll all be added into your personal calendar so you don't miss anything. And as I talk about missing things, and what's really important is all, the events that are coming up. You know, as we are working both right now, most of us at all is digital, but any event that the Open Mainframe Project will be have a presence at will be showcased on our events page. And this includes events like SHARE, GSE, um, and other large events where you have like minds coming together. And so if you or your company is going to one of these events, you can request booth branding kits. So you can get stickers, signs, and we also have, as I mentioned before, the swag store. So if you want to wear shirts like I'm wearing, I've got the open mainframe <laughs> project shirt on. You can order it from our swag store. So you can provide stickers, branding, and also swag material for your events. Um, and one of the things I wanted to mention is the fact that it's a big shout out for our upcoming inaugural open mainframe summit being held online September 16th through 17th. So this summit will bring together all the different types of mainframers from the new to Z, the seasoned professionals, developers, students, faculty, educators, all coming together to share best practices over two days, discuss hot topics. So please, please register and sign up to learn technical insights from the best and brightest. And that is September 16th and 17th. So that is coming up. And then, so, Kind of wrapping up, there's many ways to get involved, but to really find out more, you know, subscribe to our newsletter so you get the information about events and other things that are coming up. Check out the opportunities um, around the membership, in, and we have links here on the on the site. But look how ways you can join, and and please ask us questions. You all here, we're all here. Everyone on this call here will be able to answer questions, but we'd love to to make sure that you learn more about and participate in the Open Mainframe Project. So. Finally, also make sure we are social. So check us out on, on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, we make sure that we let information about, about speakers, you know, different webinars, events, those will all be on, on Twitter and also on LinkedIn. So with that, I will pass it back to John to answer some questions. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you all the great speakers here. I, I've, I'm involved with the project, but I love to sit back and just hear um, folks from our community um, talking about all the great things that are going on um, within the project and just mainframe open source in general. So this is this has been really fascinating, and I just want to want to thank everybody um, for all their help and support with that. So uh, we had some questions coming in the background, and again, if you have more questions and we haven't got to yours. Um, you know, as we're going through here, again, please let me know and I can um, help answer some questions here. So uh, looking through here, one of the questions I saw coming in was around uh, the COBOL training. And, and Sudharsha, this might be a good question for you here, um, is uh, which version of COBOL is being used for the training and is COBOL one of the options uh, with GCC? So that'd be the, the GNU compiler. Um, I don't know if you have any context on that one, uh, Sadarsha. 
Yep. Hey, um, thank you, John. I was just reading that uh, question as well. It's a good pick. Um, the the version I am um, going to have to verify, but it is definitely uh, one that is after version 4.2. But I'm just not sure if we're running version 6.3, which is the latest on our uh, system that we've um, handed out for access to COBOL. Um, so yes, though, it is the enterprise COBOL version. So it is um, not the GC, uh, the GNU COBOL. So this is for enterprise COBOL, and we actually run the labs on our um, mainframe system. Awesome, awesome. And while I have you, I have one more COBOL question that came in, so we'll keep you we'll keep you hot here. Um, All right. So for this COBOL, is this the COBOL for MVS CI CS versus Linux, or does it does it cover both? This is for ZOS COBOL. That is true. Okay. So this does not cover the Linux version. Nope. Gotcha. Gotcha. Perfect. All mm -hmm. right. Well, thank you so much um, for that here. Um, I think there's some questions. I know Alex Kim has been in the background answering some questions. Thank you, Alex. There was a great one about, do you need to be a COBOL programmer to be part of the open mainframe project? And that's a definite no there. Um, you know, uh, we, there's so many different efforts within the open mainframe project. The COBOL initiatives is certainly one of them, but, you know, Sujay was speaking around Zoe. Um, and we have, uh, you know, 10 other really fantastic projects that you can get involved in. Um, you can still get to be a part of the COBOL course program. Um, you know, you can head to our website um, to learn more uh, about the project. And um, also um, IBM, who's right now offering, um, you know, this up as a lab. And I think other organizations may over time as well. Um, kind of quickly skimming through here. Um, another question about can the COBOL training be taken remotely? Yes, um, it's designed to be a remote take your own um, pace uh, training course. Uh, so good, good question on that front. I'm just kind of skimming here to see if there's anything um, I might have missed here. Um, I think from what I can see, that is really all the big ones. Um, I know there was somebody made a comment, Share has even had its own operating system. Uh, so, and, and, and Mark had posted a great blog uh, post of um, some of the history of open source in that realm. Thank you, um, you know, for sharing uh, that one there. Um, I think that kind of covers all of the questions that I'm seeing here. Uh, so kind of just to wrap up from the, from the back end um, uh, Yvette, uh, which she was talking about. Um, we have a couple things coming up here for the Open Mainframe Project over the next um, few months here, um, and also some very immediate things. We announced our swag store. Um, so if you want to get your Open Mainframe Project garb, t-shirts, socks, um, stickers, including stickers from all of our projects, go to store.openmainframeproject.org. Um, you can check that out. And then in September, we are hosting our very first um, inaugural Open Mainframe Summit. And it's a great cross section between the mainframe community and the open source community. Um, we see so many tie-ins before and, and also just some of the great open source that's happening in mainframe, not even just the projects that are part of Open Mainframe Project, but just so many efforts outside of that. And we really wanna build cohese that community and bring them all together. That is in September, um, the call for papers is open right now. So if you happen to be doing anything amazing on mainframe related to open source, please submit. Um, and if you want to attend, um, just like open source summits, $50 and you get a wealth of information for that. Um, so definitely go check that out. Um, if you look at the Linux Foundation events page um, or the open mainframe project events page, you can learn more of how to get started. So with that, I think we might wrap up for today. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers. All these speakers did a wonderful job. They took time out of their day. They've spent uh, you know, a lot of time making sure we can educate really the open source community on, on what the Open Mainframe Project's all about. Um, I definitely encourage all of you to, to reach out to us. Um, check out the project. Check out the work that's going on. Follow us on social. Um, and we definitely hope to see you at an event upcoming, hopefully Open Mainframe Summit in uh, September. Uh, so with that, thank you so much. Hope you've enjoyed your open source summit experience um, and have yourself a great weekend. And for those of you in the United States, a great holiday weekend. Thank you.